Hi there, I'm Lou. And I'm Lee. And this is Uncovering History. And this is our very first podcast, which we're really, really excited about. So today we're going to be talking to you about the history of Halloween, which is interesting as today it is the 31st of October. So happy Halloween, everybody. The first thing we'd like to do, though, at the beginning of our podcast is to look back um, on history and look at what happened on this day in a random year. And I've got two facts for you today, Lee. Okay, go for it. So the first one is in 1941, after 14 years of work, the Mount Rushmore National Memorial is completed. That is incredible, isn't it? It is indeed. It's a long time, but hard work pays off. Absolutely. 14 years. That's incredible. I don't know what takes 14 years these days. Everything. Everything. Well, it's like when they build these skyscrapers, they go up within months, don't they? I mean, 14 years is a, an epic amount of work. So, and I know it's still very, very popular today. The second one is a little bit more morbid. Um, in 1952, the United States explodes the first hydrogen bomb at, um, in Wektok Atoll in the Pacific. That is interesting isn't it that they explode these bombs in the pacific do you know why they do that uh it's, it's a way to test so they you've seen it recently with korea um over waters towards japan and it's just a way that they can test the explosion radius or what happens at a certain point without exploding it to know what could potentially happen in the actual environment i guess also to stop it hurting people as well they do it in remote locations you, you'd hope so yeah <laughs> We hope so. Anyway, so we are going to be looking at Halloween today. Um, and I wanted to start off really by looking at Halloween in the UK. If you didn't know already, both myself and Lee are British. Um, I'm not sure if you could tell by our dodgy accents though. Um, but Halloween has been really interesting for me because in the UK, when I was younger, it seemed to be a lot more popular. Do you think, Lee, that Halloween is increasing in popularity or decreasing in the UK? Uh, I'd say it's definitely declining, especially from growing up in the UK, sort of when I was a teenager, you could see it declining then, but there was still some sort of desire for it to occur. However, now it feels like typically where you'd get a lot of children or teenagers knocking on doors, having fun, having parties, exploring, going out in groups each year. I don't remember the last time somebody knocked on our door. It's probably three years ago now, maybe four years ago since somebody tried to trick or treat um in our surrounding area and i think that kind of shows and it's sad really because if you look at places like the us where they have their parties their gatherings their pageantry and it's something that's looked looked forward to mm -hmm. here is here is the complete opposite yeah i mean we live you know somewhere where there is quite a few families and yet like you said i actually can't remember the last time someone knocked on our door on on the 31st of october asking for for sweets but there we go. But it is odd, though, because I think the shops in the UK are really trying to capitalise on on maybe the lockdown restrictions and getting people to spend a bit more money on Halloween. So it seems to have blown up this year. Uh, but again, we still had no kids tonight. So I guess it's just something that the British don't really celebrate. But yeah, there we go. Um, so... When I was looking at Halloween, I was kind of trying to think about how I used to celebrate it. And, you know, in all honesty, and I have to be honest here, I only ever went trick or treating once, once. And this is going to be really embarrassing. So try not to laugh. But um, it was very kind of last minute decision with some friends. I had no money. I was quite young. I didn't, you know, I couldn't just pop to the shops and get get a, uh, a some sort of, you know, costume. Um, and you know what I went as? No, but tell me. <laughs> well, um, I was lucky enough to find a plastic bin bag underneath the sink and decided, you know what? I'm going to be crafty. I'm going to cut some holes in it and go as a um, dark ghost. Absolutely shocking. <laughs> And th I just remember the faces on the people, the adults where I knocked on the door and they were just looking at me thinking, well, 
poor child. Pity. Pity. It was just total pity. And I think that coupled with me saying treacle treats, because I literally <laughs> thought it was treacle treats rather than trickle treat. It was just, it was, it was just, yeah. Awful, okay, awful, no, awful. It was, <laughs> yeah, it was an awful year for me. And I think that put me off for life. So my one and only experience of trick-or-treating and um, it was pretty horrific. But, you know, I do look across at the States and it's amazing how much effort and preparation families and kids and, you know, schools and societies put into Halloween. I think it's quite nice, actually. What do you think about it? Yeah, no, you, I mean, you see it, you see it sort of glorified on TV here. Um, and it, it is something I would like to experience because it doesn't seem to me, and obviously it could just be what they portray on TV, but it seems that families and roads actually get involved together. So you have like road parties and you have gatherings where everyone is dressed up in really sort of pageantry driven costumes so where they've taken a lot of time and often spent a lot of money. Um, and it's just something we never really experienced here, sort of. When when I went trick or treating as a teenager or as a child with my parents, um, the the night consisted of picking a rough route of a certain amount of houses that you'd knock on to obtain sweets, and then you would go home, and that would be it. May, as a teenager, maybe I'd watch a horror film with a couple of friends or something like that, mm. or I'd have a sleepover. But there was no there was no parties, there was no there was no planning. Um, it was all kind of very sort of rudimental in essence i bet i can guess what you went as in your costume what was it a grumpy old man by any chance <laughs> it was it was every year it was the same it was just a grumpy old man grumpy old man a look to the future <laughs> a look to the present <laughs> yeah so um i was when I was doing my research, I was really, really surprised to find out that even though the UK isn't really involved in Halloween as much as other countries, it actually, the idea of Halloween originated from um, the British Isles. Did you know that? I didn't, but do tell. So um, Halloween's origins date back to um, the ancient Celtic festival of Samhain, spelt S-A-M-H-A-I-N. So the Celts, who lived around 2000 years ago, mostly in the Irish area um, of the United Kingdom and also in northern France, celebrated their New Year on the 1st of November. Now, they celebrated New Year on the 1st of November because they associated the months after, so December, January, February, as the dark months. Um, and there was this heavy correlation with death. Now, if you think about, you know, life you know, in, in the modern days, those months typically for people in our hemisphere, it's really, really cold and dark. I mean, you know, it's not even five o'clock and it's dark in the UK now and it's constantly raining. It's really, really miserable. And I think, you know, for people that were maybe a bit older, these months would be quite scary because obviously, you know, it goes hand in hand with cold, horrible weather and illness. So, they used to celebrate their, their new year on the 1st of November and they marked October 31st, uh, with this festival called Sowin. Um, and they believed at, at this point in the calendar that the ghosts of the dead returned to earth. So in addition to causing trouble and damaging crops, Celts thought that the presence of the otherworldly spirits made it easier for the Druids or Celtic priests to make predictions about the future. Um, and what's really, really interesting is that even though there was this kind of window, this opening between, you know, the 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 world with life and, and, and the dead, they use these festivals to really predict the future, which isn't what we do now. So I don't know, Halloween in a nutshell to me is, you know, almost, I get it. There is that kind of link to that otherworldly window as it were, but I don't, do you know of anyone celebrating the future on Halloween? No, to me, I, I guess, I guess it's changed sort of, um, historically it was it was done for a purpose it was done for a meaning it was done as a way of protecting or having some form of ritual which would have purpose for the next year however in our day and age it's done to earn revenue i feel um mm -hmm. so for instance the history of horror the genre that was created um the sort of blood and sadness that was encapsulated within wasn't part of history that's something that has been developed over the last sort of 50 years. 
And, and it shows really because when you look into the history, uh, although this is a hor- horrifying history podcast, um, there isn't that much that's actually truly horrific about Halloween. It mm. was more about the spiritual presence or the ritualistic sort of motions that they went through on a yearly basis. Yeah. And it was more this kind of community coming together, actually, on a, you know, at a time where there were doubts about crops and there were doubts about how they would feed themselves, you know, in the next couple of winter months. Um, So, you know, these druids would build huge sacred bonfires um, and people would gather to burn crops um, and animals as sacrifices to the Celtic deities, Um, which, you know, sounds pretty horrific now, but actually back then that was quite normal. Um, You know, if you think back to ancient folklore and and the Greeks and, and, you know, things of that sort, sort of nature, you know, there was a lot of sacrificing to the gods and that was their way of kind of um, appeasing them and and hopefully making sure that their future was, you know, stable and, you know, they could earn money from crops and feed themselves, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so even though, you know, the idea of, you know, burning crops and, and animals now is is not very nice actually that was pretty pretty normal so um during these celebrations um the celts would often wear costumes and i guess that's where the idea of you know children dressing up and even adults as well dressing up in these costumes has originated and followed this tradition even you know those 2000 years ago it's still something that people do um so they would uh Typically, these costumes would consist of animal heads and skins. I can't imagine that smell very nice. That that would be pretty awful, wouldn't it? The smell. Could you imagine? Especially if you're hot. I oh, yeah. guess it's using what you have available to you. And if there's constant sacrifices going on, then you're going to have a lot of animal skin available at hand. Exactly. And I guess you couldn't just pop down the local shop and be like, oh, I'll just buy that skeleton costume. Yeah, let's get that ghost mask. So they had to just use their imagination, I guess, and use, like you said, what they had in front of them to create these costumes. And again, remember that they were doing this to kind of appease the gods um, and their deities. Um, so they also attempted to tell each other's fortunes. And this is a bit more about what I was saying about predicting the future. So instead of sort of more the dead, even though that was part of it at, at some point, they would often gather and tell each other's fortunes. And usually it would be about um, who the women would marry. Now, again, I, I guess I'm not sure that's that, you know, as common now as it, as it was, but, you know, it was more community kind of spirit and you know this telling of fortunes is actually quite a positive thing so when the celebration was over they then relit their half um fires at home with with um the embers from the bonfire so previously they would have extinguished their fires and then relit their um, fires with with um remnants from from the sacred bonfire and they did this to try and protect themselves from um any sort of evil or um you know to make sure that their crops grow and you know that they would survive the winter months and that they were very uh spiritualistic in that sort of way so um by 43 AD the Roman empire had conquered the majority of celtic territory so in the course of around 400 years that they ruled the celtic lands Two festivals of Roman origin were combined with the traditional Celtic celebration of Samhain. So the first was a festival called Feralia. So I may not be pronouncing that right, but Feralia, F-E-R-A-L-I-A. And this was a day in late October uh, when the Romans traditionally commemorated the passing of the dead. So I guess this is where we get the idea of sort of, you know, looking back at, at, the, at the dead. And rather than just worshipping gods, we then get this combination of, you know, people worshipping the dead. Do you know much about people worshipping the dead in, in other countries or? Not too much, no, but I do, I do know a little bit. But, um, I guess the most common would be Dia de los Muertos, which is Day of the Dead, which is popularized through Mexico. And it featured recently in the most recent James Bond film titled Spectre. And it's essentially a day to remember the dead, remember the passing and to have a day where you feel like they are still here with you. Um, and that's only been popularized in the last sort of 20, 30 years in Mexico. Prior to that, it did exist. However, it existed in more the indigenous 
sort of circles outside of the main cities that we know that celebrated so heavily today. Um, and it's a tradition that's existed for thousands of years, dating back to the Aztecs, roughly 3,000 years ago. And once again, it was a day to remember the dead. I guess the kind of these traditions do run through you know these these groups of people that and obviously we we still celebrate some of the aspects of these traditions which i think is really quite interesting but so that was the first day uh feralia and then the second was a day to honor pomana so the roman goddess of fruit and trees and the symbol of pomana is the apple and the incorporation of this celebration into sowing probably explains the tradition of apple bobbing um, that is practiced today on Halloween. Now, do, have you ever apple bobbed? I have once when I was a teenager, but it was cold. It wasn't fun. And at the end of it, all you got was an apple. I just remember these big barrels of water and these apples. And you had to dip your head in this cold, horrible, slightly dirty water, grab an apple with your teeth, which was incredibly difficult. Nice. And then... I would just remember shoving your face in in some sort of flower to get a lolly. See, I see, I didn't have to do the flower, um, but you're right, and it is, it is actually really difficult to bite an apple because they're not the softest fruit. So it's uh, the longer your face is in cold water of a cold evening, the harder it is to sort of function, and and you just you just I just got a bit fed up really. But it's sort of going going back to what we said before. There's a lot of different traditions that are celebrated in different ways, but they ultimately mean the same thing. Mm. Um, and this was the case with apple, bob, a, apple bobbing as well, sorry. Um, I, I prefer apple bobbing. Apple bobbing. <laughs> so what typically happened before was it was a form of divination and it was mostly done by females. And what they would do is they would have a certain insignia, be it a, a cross or a face or something that meant something to them, and they would scribe it on the apple and then they would put it in the apple bobbing keg I guess you is what was typically used mm. um, and filled with water and then multiple women would do this at a gathering or a party and we're talking sort of over 100 years ago now so not what you'd expect today from a party but it was a way of them showcasing or picking who their future spouse would be that's really interesting because actually that links into um another tradition that the Celtics did they used to um uh, they had nutmegs, so nuts, and uh, women used to basically each each nut would resemble a person um, or you know a potential spouse, and they used to throw them in the fire, um, and the one that didn't burn uh, would be the person that that woman would marry. So there's, there's very similar tradition. I think that also links back to the idea of of telling these fortunes about who they would who would they would end up marrying, which is really interesting. Yeah, no, I agree. And, I, and like I said before, it feels like there are, if, if, if we were able to track everything in the world, there would be tens of thousands of very, very similar rituals, but all, all conducted and completed in a completely different way. And I guess over time, things evolve or, or change. And this is showcased here, whereas the actual act has changed, mm. the reason for doing it remains the same. Yeah, yeah, true. So this kind of then takes us to All Saints Day. So um, on May the 13th, 16, uh, 609 AD, Pope Boniface IV dedicated the Pantheon in Rome in honour of all Christian martyrs. And the Catholic feast of All Martyrs Day was established in the Western Church. Um, so Pope Gregory III later expanded the festival to include all saints as well as all martyrs and moved the observance from May the 13th to November the 1st. And I think by, I think it was the ninth century, the influence of, of Christianity had started to spread. So um, obviously in the UK, Christianity is, you know, one of our main religion. I, there's many religions, um, but, you know, one of the main influences in, in the UK is Christianity. Um, and that had spread into the Celtic lands as well, uh, where it gradually started to blend with the sub, uh, supplanted older Celtic rites. Uh, so in a thousand AD, the church made November the 2nd, All Souls Day, a day to honour the dead. So again, we're coming back to the idea of around this time of year, you know, not only would you be uh, praying to the deities and the gods to kind of deliver good crops and have a, you know, almost like a blessing to uh, survive those awful winters 
into months. But it was also a time to kind of reflect on the passing of of loved ones before you, um, which you know I find I find quite interesting too. So um, it's widely believed today that the church was attempting to replace the Celtic Festival of the Dead with a related church sanctioned holiday. So, I, you know, I, I, I'll be honest, I don't know much about religion and, and, you know, and the powers of the church. But it is interesting that, you know, back then the church had a lot of sway and a lot of power. Um, and I guess they were trying to sort of take on those traditions and almost recreate it into something a little bit more Christian. So All Souls Day was celebrated similarly to Sowen with they had big bonfires and they dressed up and there were parades and costumes, but the costumes were of saints, angels, and also devils. So a little bit different to dressing up in the skin of animals and, and the heads of animals, which is pretty barbaric. Um, and the All Day, All Saints Day celebration was also called All Hallows or All Hallow Mass. Uh, so from, um, the, it just basically means All Saints Day. Um, and the night before it, the traditional night of sowing, uh, in the Celtic religion began to be called All Hallows Eve. And eventually that is where the name Halloween came from, which again, you can see the kind of lineage of the history of this celebration. Um, and there's so much detail to this that I, I never really knew this before at all. I just thought it was something that, I don't know, I honestly had no idea where Halloween came from. And like I said at the beginning of this podcast, I was absolutely baffled that it came, you know, from somewhere so close to us here in the UK. So that takes us to Halloween going across to America. Now, you know, one of the biggest influences in America was uh, the uh, Irish who um, immigrated across. Um, and obviously, because, you know, the Celts were, were basically an island, they took those traditions with them. And that's how they started to form in America. So, the celebration of Halloween itself was extremely limited uh, in colonial New England because of the rigid Protestant belief system there. And Halloween was much more common in Maryland and the southern colonies. And as the beliefs and, and customs of different European ethnic groups and the American Indians meshed, um, I, I guess a distinctly American version of Halloween began to emerge. And the first celebrations included play parties, which were public events held to celebrate the harvest. Neighbours would share stories of the dead and tell each other's fortunes, dance and sing. So again, we still have these fortunes. We still have this link to... Um, talking about future and hoping for for good luck and wealth and prosperity um what i don't know though is where these we call them pumpkins in the uk but in the in america they're widely known as jack-o'-lanterns but i actually don't know anything about it do you i do and i was able to learn about the irish folk figure named jack-o'-lantern the saying goes connected if you ever meet the devil on a darkened road, don't try to trick him into climbing a tree. Now, one night, a mischievous local drunkard named Jack trapped the Prince of Darkness, or the devil, in a tree by hacking a sign of the cross into the bark. Given the history between heaven and hell, this effectively trapped the devil in his place. As a way of an exchange, Jack made the devil promise to never claim his soul, as he typically would with other wrongdoers when their life eventually comes to a close. The devil, without any other choice, agreed. Jack went on to live a, very, a life full of trouble, and when he eventually died, he was not granted a place into heaven due to his transgressions. Jack tried to barter with the devil for a place in hell. However, the devil held up his end of the deal, as he said he would when that exchange first took place. The devil, for good measure, also hurled a piece of coal from hell at the dead man as a sort of slight or I've won. With nowhere to go, Jack placed the blazing coal in a turnip to use as a lantern. The dead man then set out, doomed to wonder, until he could find his eternal resting place. We now know of these turnips as pumpkins, or as known in America, jack-o'-lanterns. Hmm, that's really interesting. Um, have you ever carved a pumpkin? I've tried, but <laughs> poor effort. The, one, the ones that you see that are sort of scary or or very detailed. I mean, mine literally just had a creepy smile and that was it. Excellent. 
Um, I found it really tricky to get all the stuff out from inside of it. So I just gave up and then just tried to kind of punch a few holes <laughs> in the face. Just like one large, annoying pepper. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so this kind of takes us to the history of trick or treating, not treacle treat. <laughs> But if anyone has a trick or treat, I would love one. Thank you. Um, so borrowing from the European traditions, Americans began to dress up in costumes and go house to house asking for food or money. Um, and that practice basically turned into the, what we know today as trick or treating. Um, so young women believe that on Halloween, they could divine the name of appearance or appearance of their future husband by doing tricks with yarn, apple pairings or mirrors. Um, and then in the late 1800s, there was a move in America to mold Halloween into a holiday more about community and neighborly get togethers than actually, you know, ghosts and pranks and witchcrafts and werewolves and zombies, etc. Um, and at the turn of the century, Halloween parties for both children and adults actually became quite popular and really, really common. Um, and it was a way to celebrate the day. And that has stuck. You know, that was back in the 1800s. And now we're in what, 2020. And there's still, you know, people celebrating. Halloween in this sort of way. Um, so that those parties really focused on games, foods of the season and festive costumes as well, which is pretty much what people do um, today. Um, but parents were encouraged by newspapers and community leaders to try and take anything frightening um, out of the day or grotesque um, out of the celebrations. And because of you know, the efforts by the newspapers, Halloween lo lost most of its superstitious and religious overtones by the beginning of the 20th century. So that's why there's no real connection now to Halloween and any sort of religion, purely because it was a marketing campaign, which I didn't know. But there we go. And then, you know, Halloween parties in the 20s and 30s of, you know, 1920s, 1930s, um, have become a secular, um, but community centered holiday with parades and town wide Halloween parties, um, and you know, everything that we know of Halloween now. But despite the best efforts of many schools and communities, vandalism, um, started to plague some celebrations in many communities during this time. And I guess this is where we get the idea that, you know, there's quite a bit of crime around Halloween because, I mean, think about it. People are out late at night. It's dark. It's cold. Um, and people generally feel quite unsafe in the dark. And I guess you get quite a bit of, um, you know, sort of cr crime and that sort of thing. Well, I guess it's also because usually their faces are covered. So it's oh, more yeah. harder to identify people. But that's definitely a trend that we've seen in the UK, specifically England, in the last sort of like couple of decades. And that unfortunately is what started out as fun being trick or treat, which would have been a harmless sort of trick, mm. became very common that trick would involve eggs. And unfortunately, it would usually involve the children or sometimes even adults, which is even more worrying about the sort of way the generation is evolving. But that's another story, but would um, involve egging houses. So if, if, for instance, the person wasn't in or the person didn't give candy or they didn't want to sort of socialise with the child, then sometimes the, egg, the, the house would be egged. And it is, it, I guess that comes back to why we see a decline in, in children and families going out. And that is just because it unfortunately has become an avenue in which people can commit crime more mm -hmm. easily and also an avenue in which children can misbehave in a way that just isn't really great for anyone. What is it with eggs and teenagers? Because not only is, you know, it's synonymous with, you know, Halloween tricks, but I, I don't know if this happens across different countries, but when um, kids leave school, for some reason, they like to throw eggs and flour at each other. It's so weird. It's because it sticks. Oh, is that why? Well, that you throw the egg and then the, the flour makes it stick. Of course. Ah, oh, okay. So Fair it enough. makes it more difficult to get off. But it is true and it's... I just think, I honestly think eggs just need to stay in the kitchen. Hmm. <laughs> well, you can't actually, if you try and buy an egg as a child, unaccompanied or without ID, they won't sell eggs to you in England anymore. What? Yeah, it happened. I remember it started when I was a teenager. So our local stores, I I never ate because I didn't see the point. I just wanted the chocolate. But 
they would stop selling eggs and it's still the same now. Is it, it is it just around Halloween or? Uh, yeah, it's around Halloween because they know that typically that's when groups of teenagers go out with hundreds of eggs <laughs> with the sole intention of throwing them at people. Um, drive by egging. It happened to my friend actually drive by egging. Did it? When, when we were teenagers, um, we were just out in our costumes. There was three of us and um, a sort of a, a pickup truck drove by with the back end open oh, and there God. were lots of kids in the back so obviously an adult had agreed to this oh, and they no. were launching eggs they missed me but they hit my friend in the head um and obviously it cracked and it left it he actually had a bruise around well, his sort of temple i don't know if you've ever i used to do these experiments at school with eggs but if you hold it and you try and squeeze the egg with you know just one hand it's it's almost impossible they are hard They're, they hurt as well because <laughs> i, I Apart from that scenario, I have been egged during that during the sort of Halloween events, and it, it does hurt. It really does hurt. Oh God! So yeah, stick the egg in the kitchen, please. No eggs anywhere else. They're just yeah. Oh, anyway. So by the 1950s, uh, town leaders had successfully limited vandalism, um, and basically Halloween had evolved into a holiday directed mainly at the young, which I guess is what we have now. Um, so due to the high numbers of young children during the 50s baby boom, parties moved from town civic centres into the classroom or home where they could be more easily accommodated. So lots of parties, really big kind of emphasis on, you know, the, the kind of fun and frivolity of Halloween rather than the kind of (laughs) torturous egg throwing. Um, But basically, a new American tradition was born through this and it has continued to grow. And I found this fact out. So today... um, Americans spend, and this is this is crazy, an estimated six billion pounds annually on Halloween. Six billion pounds just on Halloween. It's a lot of money. I, I, you wouldn't even think they spend six thousand pounds in the UK with how it goes. I, honestly, I wouldn't be surprised if it if it was less than that. But six billion. I mean, I know America's big, mm. large, you know, extensive, but that is an awful lot of money. And basically, it it makes it the country's second largest commercial holiday after Christmas. It's not surprising they love, but even more so than New Year's. Mm. I find that crazy i guess with new year's it's just one day whereas with halloween it can be spent across multiple days and turned into sort of a maybe a weekend event especially if it, if halloween falls on the weekend so i yeah. guess they can they can get more than one day out of it so i was also doing some research on you know obviously trick and treat trick so it's not all i want to say is treacle treating no trick or treating um there, when it first started really gaining popular, popularity in the early 1900s, um, basically parents were really, really scared about these horrific human beings poisoning all the children with sweets. Um, and basically, I think it was about 1970 that um, it became unacceptable for families to give um, any sort of sweet that wasn't commercially wrapped. Mm. So um, traditionally, it would have been, you know, homemade cookies and, and things of that sort of nature. But because there was just this fear in parents that, you know, these kids are going to get poisoned by the horrible old man down the road um it was in 1970 that it was literally not acceptable for any child to take sweets that weren't in a proper wrapper which i don't know just doesn't sound like the kids are well the parents are very trusting does it no and i, I guess as well as, as it's become more sort of like commercially driven there are now nothing that isn't packaged so it's a lot easier but like you said back then they're just there wasn't the same type of stores available to to purchase such candy or sweets or chocolate or whatever you'd like to say. Yeah, I guess so. And that kind of takes us on to um, the idea of All Souls Day and Soul Cakes. 
Okay, so another foodie. You know I like food. Um, so the American Halloween tradition of trick-or-treating probably dates back to the early All Souls Day parades in England. Um, and during the festivities, poor citizens would often beg for food and families would give them pastries called soul cakes uh, in return for their promise to pray for the family's dead relatives. So again, that link back to kind of, you know, praying for the dead. Um, so the distribution of soul cakes was encouraged by the church as a way to replace the ancient practice of leaving food and wine for roaming spirits. So the practice, which was referred to as going a-souling, was eventually taken up by children who would visit the houses in their neighbourhood and be given ale, food and money. Hmm. We couldn't give children ale now. That's illegal. <laughs> They'd already have it. <laughs> well, that you can't, not all of them. There are some nice kids out there. Um, so this tradition of dressing in costume for Halloween has both uh, European and Celtic roots. Um, hundreds of years ago, winter was an uncertain and frightening time and food supplies often ran really, really low. Um, so for many people, they were afraid of the dark and the short days of winter were full of constant worry. So then on Halloween, when it was believed that these ghost ghosties, the ghostly spirits came back to the earthly world, people thought, that they would encounter ghosts if they left their homes. So to avoid this um, being recognised by, you know, these these ghosties, people would wear masks when they left their homes after dark so that the ghosts would mistake them for fellow spirits. So I guess this is, again... Uh, you know, we already had the tradition of the Celts wearing, you know, uh, you know, animal heads and skins and stuff. But as it kind of goes on, that idea of hiding your face to kind of hide your identity um, on Halloween is, is interesting. So on Halloween, to keep ghosts away from their houses, people would place bowls of food outside their homes also to appease these ghosts and prevent them from attempting to enter. Didn't know that. And I guess it sort of goes back to what, what you spoke about earlier about the sort of survivalistic nature of it, whereas Halloween today is celebrated as a way of having fun, um, giving gifts, having sweets, chocolate, all of the good stuff that everyone loves and enjoys. Um, back then, it was more about surviving, getting through these darker, more sort of dangerous months um, and doing everything they could to ensure their continuity for the next year. Mm. So it's, it's, it's the complete opposite of what, of what we do now. Yeah. Um, and also we've got some, uh, rituals as well that we haven't really spoken about. So we've spoken about the nutmegs in the fire. Um, we've st spoken about, was it the apples? The apple bobbing. Apple bobbing. But there's also another one where, uh, young women used to toss apple peels over their shoulders, um, hoping that the peels would fall on the floor in the shape of their future husband's initials. Um, and they tried to learn about their futures by peering at egg yolks floating in a bowl of water and stood in front of mirrors and darkened rooms holding candles and looking over their shoulders for their husband's faces. See, that just sounds like the start of a horror film. <laughs> Actually, it does, doesn't it? We could make a good horror film. Mm. Um, and I just, because I know about throwing salt over your shoulder for, for is it for luck? Or for to, good luck, yeah. To ward off any sort of evil spirits or anything. Um, but throwing apple peels over your shoulder and hoping it lands in, in the shape of your your future husband's initials. I think they're reaching with that one. <laughs> a little bit, a little bit. Um, so other rituals were also more competitive. So at some Halloween parties, the first guest to find a burr on a chestnut hunt would be the first to marry. Um, at others, the first successful apple bobber uh, would be the first down the aisle. So it does all kind of link into this kind of future marriage prophecies sort of thing. Very spiritualistic. Really, really spiritualistic. So whether we're asking for romantic advice or trying to avoid seven years of bad luck, um, each one of those Halloween superstitions relies really on the goodwill of the very same spirits whose presence the early Celts felt so keenly. So even though these traditions are a little bit later than, you know, the original traditions, there's still this kind of, you know, almost like this reference back to the original um, Celts and how they celebrated so basically that really wraps everything up for Halloween. Um, we've kind of looked at a, 
a, quite a whistle stop tour of how Halloween has, you know, progressed and where it's originated from and, you know, why it's become so popular in the United States. Not so much in the UK. Um, but you know, there we go. Um, so thank you so much for taking the time to listen to our very, very first podcast. We know it wasn't, isn't, uh, the, you know, a polished article, but, um, your, you know, support does mean so much to us. And yeah, this is something that we have really enjoyed making and we look forward to making more of them.